to another video in my build log series of the Trumpeter 1 to 200 scale model of the Titanic. This is part 71 and today I am working on the aft section of the model uh, and I'm doing mainly railings. So as you can see the entire poop deck is now railinged up. Uh, I've also fitted the propeller notice boards and I have fitted all of the equipment and railings to the after bridge as well. So that pretty much concludes the stern section with the exception of the flagstaff and also the rear anchor. Um, but quite a lot of progress today. So without any further ado, let's crack on. Right, I'm just starting off by doing the railings on the poop deck. And I think really these are quite a lot harder than the railings on uh, A deck and B deck because these are sweeping curves rather than the sort of very sharp 90 degree bends that we had to do on A deck and B deck. So these are a touch harder. Um, now the way I am choosing to do it is to add a bit of a pre-bend into my railing. Clearly this is not the right shape, that looks dreadful, but that's not really the point. What I'm trying to do here is I'm just trying to take a little bit of stress out of the glue joints. Because you see, if I were to stick this down as a straight piece of railing, from the second I stick it down, that railing will be straining against the glue to spring back into a straight shape. Uh, and, you know, this model might sit on a shelf for 20 years. So for 20 years, that railing is gonna be straining against the glue to try to become a straight shape again. So to take a little bit of the stress out of it, I've sort of pre-bent this. So obviously it is going to be slightly straining but there's going to be far less, this is, when I stick this down, it'll be far less out of shape because I've pre-bent it than it would have been had it been straight, which means the glue is going to have far less strain on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by getting this absolutely in the centre. So you can see here, this is the central section, and we've got four sections, one, two, three, four. What that means is that this railing here, this positive, this upstand, that is the dead centre. So that wants to go right there where the flagstaff is. And then we'll work our way around. So, crack on. So what I've done is I've got that into position and it's now being held in place with some blue tack. And what I will do now is glue it down. Right, the next section is from here down to here and along. Uh, and so for that, we've got this piece. <clears throat> now I can't really tell whether it's deliberate that they're adding a little extra in, just in case things don't line up properly, or whether I've created a bit of an error myself, but I'm lining this up and what I'm using as a gauge is this little bar here, which rests in the middle here. And you can see that when I do that, I've got ooh, about three millimetres overlap here, which is not an issue, not something to worry about, just something to be aware of. Now these are quite easy to align because they sort of fit in and around the deck equipment, so it's quite straightforward. The other thing to note is that this particular section of railing also has a bend of 90 degrees to go along here. So that should be easily doable. First, what I'll do is I'll get it stuck in along most of its length. And what I will do as well is I'll just take a pair of snips and chop off the excess. Because we don't want excess.
Right, the next things I'm adding, and I've been looking forward to this, is I'm adding these. The notice boards warning us of propellers. Now, for this, I am using this small photo etch set. Uh, and as you can see, you get red ones and you get black ones. And as you can see, because there are three black ones cut out, I am going with black boards. More on this later. For now, I'm just going to show you how I'm sticking them down. So I've already done the one at the very aft. Uh, and I now need to do the two on the side. So make sure that you get them the right way up. And then just plonk them down. Very simple. I'll zoom, I'll zoom in a bit so you can see. These are really nicely done actually. You know, they have the genuine, you can actually read the wording. So I'll read the other one for you. Notice, this vessel has triple screws. Keep clear of blade. And they do look really nice. And it's just another little bit of really fun, nice detail that adds to the model a bit more. So I'll now do the other side. So why have I gone for black over red? Well, there's some pretty compelling evidence for whichever side of the argument you fall into. Um, so, as with all these things, you know, this is just my own opinion. Uh, I could very well be wrong. Um, but nonetheless, from the evidence that we have, I have come to a conclusion that I think black was probably the most realistic, um, probably the most likely colour these signs were. So, uh, I'll go into the evidence for that in just a moment, but before that, I do just want to debunk one commonly misheld conception and that is the argument i hear more than anything else for these signs being red is people say ah oh, well these are warning signs and warning signs are always red therefore they'll be red um and that's wrong on two counts firstly these aren't warning signs these are warning signs tend to say warning on them these are notice boards uh, and the second thing is warning signs aren't red anyway warning signs are yellow so, these days we live in a world of standardisation, uh, and signage, particularly safety critical signage, is no different. Uh, and that's a good thing, because if I was on holiday and I didn't speak the native language, uh, I would still be able to understand what the sign was telling me, because they're standardised. Uh, and there are four main types of safety critical signage. The first is safety condition signs, and these are green, uh, and as the name suggests, they tell you about safety conditions. So the most obvious one is fire escape. Uh, here's a photo of one on the Glasgow subway saying um, an emergency exit. But you might also see this talking about a first aiding station or something like that as well. So the next type of sign are mandatory signs, and these are blue. Uh, and these tell you that you must do something. So for example, fire door, keep locked. It's a command. Uh, eye protection, must be worn. So these are signs that say you must do something. If you want to enter this area, you have to wear eye protection. So the next type of sign is the prohibition sign, and these are the red signs. Um, and I think these are the signs that people often confuse as being warning signs. But these are not warnings. Um, you know, this isn't saying, be aware, don't enter this area, there's a hazard. These are just commands. They're telling you, do not do something. So it's a subtle difference between a warning, but it is not a warning, it's a command. Do not touch, do not enter, no smoking. You know, these are firm, concise commands. And finally, here are the signs warning you of a hazard in the area. These are the yellow signs, officially called hazard identification. But what they do is they warn you of a dangerous thing in the area. So for example, radiation. Here's one I found on a walk recently, bull in the field, but they're all doing exactly the same thing, they're just warning of a hazard. Now, do not misunderstand me, uh, I am not trying to advocate Titanic's warning boards being yellow. Um, all I'm trying to do is debunk this sort of red means warning, therefore Titanic's warning boards were red, because that doesn't really stack up. Of course, all this sort of modern standardisation was not around in Titanic's day, it wasn't around in 1912. 
But also, the concept of the colour red being associated with warnings and danger was not really a thing in 1912, certainly not to the extent that it is now. Uh, and because there's no physical evidence, there's no uh, warning boards visible at the wreck or anything like that, uh, we really have to go a bit deeper to try to find some evidence for or against the colours of these boards. So, that was a bit of a detour, but ho hopefully um, interesting. I do find that sort of stuff quite interesting. So hopefully that was um, not a waste of two minutes of people's time. Um, but why have I actually concluded these signs were black instead of red? Well, it's based on this article uh, by a man called Bob Reed. Um, so Bob has made a website called Titanic Cad Plans, and it is a fantastic resource for loads of stuff to do with Titanic. Um, masses of stuff on paint colours used on all of the Olympic class ships. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good resource for anything to do with Titanic and her sisters. Um, and he's also produced quite a few different articles, uh, usually on a fairly specific topic, you know, winch colours or uh, propeller warning board signs, uh, whatever. Uh, and this article goes into the detail, and this is the article that sort of convinced me that black was the colour, not, not red. Um, but there's a few really interesting points, the first of which is that these boards were not a necessity. Um, mer merchant shipping law of the time did not require you to have this board on your ship. So that points to these boards being there for a different reason. Um, and the most likely alternative is probably for insurance purposes. Um, but the article goes into other stuff as well. Um, one of the most compelling arguments for these boards being red is if you look at this famous photo of the ship, you can see that the notice board looks slightly off grey. It's not quite a deep black, it's certainly not as black as the hull. And so that leads a lot of people to conclude, well, it must have been red then. But actually, the particular type of film used in 1912, blue sensitive film, would render a board that was black and a board that was red looking almost identical in colour. So that doesn't really help us either. Photography of Titanic doesn't really help us either. So what the article eventually goes into is um, it looks at um, colour photos we have of ships from Titanic's sort of era. Um, and you can see that the boards are actually black. Um, so that's the sort of thing that's really convinced me. Uh, here again, another photo of Mauritania. Uh, and again, boards are black. So that's the sort of stuff that's convinced me that these were black. Um, as I say, uh, this is very much a personal preference. If you think they look better red, bash on and do it. Um, for me personally, I think black is perhaps slightly more likely, but as with so many things on Titanic, who will know for certain? So there you go. Uh, I'm not going to go through the article in its entirety myself, but I will pop a link in the description below to it. So if you want to have a read of the article, do click on that link and have a read through it. It is, um, it's, it's well written and it does weigh up all the evidence pretty concisely, I think. So it's worth having a look at if you're interested. Now, apologies, I'd forgotten to uh, press record when I started this off, but as you can see, I've got the first section in place now, and I've also made the first bend. And what you'll notice about this is it is very, very springy. Um, and it's probably to do with the fact that there's no um, wooden beam on the top of it. But this is incredibly um, floppy. It wants to bend all over the place. It's very hard to keep it straight. And that's why when I'm gluing down, I'm using a strip of mahogany just to hold the thing straight, because otherwise it would be very easy to have a wavy railing, which of course would look atrocious. Um, now, with respect to bending, these are all sharp, almost 90 degree bends without any real radius to them at all. So what I'm doing is I'm pinching with a set of pliers, uh, and then I'm using my own hand to, um, to actually bend the railing in place. Note that I've started this way, and I need to go up, along, up, along, down, along, down, along. The reason I did that was because I thought getting this long straight glued in first would make the thing a bit more secure than doing this shorter section. If I had this shorter section, this would then be sort of flopping around over here without very much support. Because it's this way, you've got ooh, seven, eight centimetres of railing already glued in place, which, you know, just, just adds to the rigidity of it a bit, and that does help.
so. Pinch in place. And then bend. So here we go, here is all the equipment for the after bridge, uh, all the stuff that needs painting. So left to right we've got the compass binnacle, two telegraph handles, one there, one there. I think this is a telephone box, and then lastly a wheel. Now on the wheel, um, the, the after bridge generally would only ever be used in port or, or, or very close to land. Um, and it certainly wouldn't be used in mid-ocean, which is where my model is set. Um, so I suspect the wheel would have been covered. You wouldn't leave a nice wooden wheel exposed to the elements. You know, you cover it probably with a canvas sheet or something like that. Um, so I'm not going to leave my wheel in this state. I'm going to cover it over with something, and I need to sort of work out how to best do that, because, you know, material will look out of scale, so... I'm tempted to cut it off and replace it with a circular sheet of plastic, uh, which I can then paint a sort of canvasy kind of colour. Um, but perhaps that, that might be something for China 3D to look at, perhaps just an additional wheel in this set which is covered over. 
Anyway, so what I need to do is I'll start by painting these all in white and then I'll pick out the details that need it. So most of this stuff will end up being in brass. The balls on the compasses will end up uh, red and uh, green, port and starboard. And there will be, you know, bits of wood colour here and there. The telegraph sides will be in black and so on and so on. So just doing the flagpoles for the afterbridge and as always with brass parts I'm starting off by giving them a coating of metal prep so that they are better able to accept the paint. And this is just a primer. just makes them, gives the paint a better surface to stick onto. So I'm just doing one end to start with. And then once that's dry, I'll paint the end I'm holding now. Right, I'm just gluing these flagpoles now onto their base. So you can see you've got this little resting point, so there's a hinge here, and the idea is that the flagpole rests on that point and then when it's hoisted, the hinge allows it to move up. So uh, there's a sort of small bracket piece, which is very small, and even though the camera is as zoomed in as it can be, uh, it's very small, but it's that piece there. And just to give you an idea of what we're aiming for, here is the other flagpole and you can see that the hinge is in place and we've got the resting point there. Now the challenge here is to make sure that we get it orientated so that that resting piece is flat and in the same dimension as the hinge because if they don't if they're not aligned properly your flagpole will look a bit weird it'll look like it's sort of floating in the air and it's one of those little things that just sort of makes it look a little bit less realistic. Now, this is a fiddly job, and it's not the sort of thing I want to wait for the glue to dry on. So what I'm doing is using kicker, or uh, accelerator. So I'm putting the flagpole on the ground, and that guarantees that the flag resting point is level. Holding it up against the hinge, and then spraying with some kicker. And Bob's your uncle. In place. Just pop that down and you see they're nicely aligned and the flagpole now sits flush but off the deck. Right, here we go. Sign in place and also all of the after bridge equipment except for the flagpoles. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't film this because I was using my phone to get 
the location of all the equipment set. Uh, and I am pretty happy with it in the end. Uh, telegraphs look very nice, as does the compass. I'm quite happy with the wheel. Um, it does look like it's sort of got a canvas cover over it, which is exactly what I'm after, because as I've said earlier, I don't think the wheel would have been operational yet. So all in all, uh, pretty nice. Just need to add the flagpoles. Uh, and then we're pretty much done on the after bridge, and indeed we're done on all of the railings and such on the aft of the model entirety. The only real thing left to go are these cranes. So, I've sort of assumed that these uh, flagstaffs for the after bridge were wooden. Uh, so, and if you know anything to the contrary, do please let me know. Uh, I can correct based on any information you have. But anyway, I've, I've sort of assumed that they were wooden, but all of the fastenings and fixings and stuff, I'm assuming are also gonna be in white. So what I've done is I've painted everything in white to start with, because I always think, well, for, for things like the stand and the hinge over there, I think that's the right color anyway. But also I think white is a very good color to start with when you're painting wood, because when you go over it with a brown, uh, the brush strokes sort of give the effect of grain anyway. So you get a, you know, you get a variation, you get variation in the colour of brown that you paint on. So I think that's, white is quite a good place to start anyway. Um, if anyone knows anything to the contrary about what these um, flagstaffs actually were, you know, if they were metal to start with or whatever, let me know and I can correct at a later date. But for now, I'm going to paint them brown. And here we are, with the flagpoles installed. Right, that seems like a good place to end this video with the vast majority of the poop deck now finished uh, and the entirety of the docking bridge finished. Uh, I'll leave you with some photos of the finished assembly. Um, but for now, if you have enjoyed this, please do like and subscribe. Um, if you've got any questions, comments, whatever, put them down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. And I will see you in the next one, which will be part 72. Bye-bye for now.